This is God's Word. And it came to pass a long time after that the Lord had given rest unto Israel from all their enemies round about, that Joshua waxed old and stricken in years. And Joshua called for all Israel and for their elders and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers, and said unto them, I am old and stricken in age. And you have seen all that the Lord your God hath done unto all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he that hath fought for you. Behold, I have divided unto you by lot these nations that remain to be an inheritance for your tribes from Jordan, with all the nations that I have cut off, even unto the great sea westward. And the Lord your God, he shall expel them from before you and drive them out of your sight. And ye shall possess their land as the Lord your God hath promised unto you. Be ye therefore very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, that ye turn not aside therefrom to the right hand or to the left, that ye come not among these nations, these that remain among you, neither make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause them to swear by them, neither serve them, nor bow yourselves unto them. But cleave unto the Lord your God, as you have done unto this day. For the Lord hath driven out from before you great nations and strong. But as for you, no man hath been able to stand before you unto this day. One man of you shall cause, shall chase a thousand for the Lord your God. He it is that fighteth for you, as he hath promised you. Take good heed therefore unto yourselves, that you love the Lord your God. Else, if you do in any wise go back and cleave unto the remnant of these nations, even these that remain among you, and shall make marriages with them, and go in unto them, and they to you know for a certainty that I, the Lord your God, will no more drive out, drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you, and scourges in your sides, and thorns in your eyes, until ye perish from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. Ending, sorry, at verse 13. Let's pray together. Father, as we come to your word just now, we thank you for it. We thank you for the revelation that you have given to us of yourself in your word. We pray that you will teach us today what we do not know, that you'll give us what we do not have, and grant, Lord, that the Holy Spirit Himself will take of the things of God and make them real to each and every one of us. For Jesus' sake. Amen. I have a question for you this morning. And the question is a very simple one, very straightforward one, very significant one. It is this What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ? And I ask this question because in our age there are many misunderstandings with regard to the Christian faith. A trip to some local bookshops confirms this observation. There you will find that the shelves are lined with books that claim to be able to teach the reader how to make the Christian life easier and the church of Jesus Christ more acceptable to the world. When the truth of the matter is this, that there is nothing easy or acceptable about the Christian life so far as the world is concerned. It's not always easy to live for the Lord Jesus. The gospel of Christ will never be acceptable to a godless world. And if we are Christians this morning, we need to be aware of this fact. We are swimming against the flu. And we're not out for a leisurely walk in the park, but we're on the battlefield rather than on the playing fields. And the book of Joshua has much to 
teach us with regards to the spiritual steps that we need to take and the practical directions that we need to follow as we encounter the world, the flesh, and the devil. As we struggle with those besetting sins and face the possibility of walking around in a spiritual wilderness. But of course, it doesn't have to be that way. God has a place of victory, and He's promised that we can live in the good of the victory of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We can live not only at peace with God, but we can know the peace of God in our hearts and in our lives, and His blessing that makes rich and adds no sorrow. We sometimes sing about that victory on the victory side, on the victory side, with Christ within, the fight will win on the victory side. The book of Joshua, of course, describes the invasion and the conquest and the settlement of God's people in the promised land, namely Cana. It's all about God's people entering the land, conquering the land, possessing the land. And the book of Joshua is the counterpart of the book of Exodus. You see, the story of Exodus is how God led His people out. The story of Joshua is how that same God led His people in. And in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 23, we read these words, And he that is God brought us out from there, that is Egypt, that he might bring us in, that is Cana, to give us a land which he swore to give unto our fathers. In Exodus, God parted the waters of the Red Sea that He might bring them out. And in Joshua, He parted the waters of the Jordan that He might bring them into the land of Cana. When you read through, read through the vocabulary of the Old Testament, there are two words that you should keep before you. One is the word hitherto, and the other is the word henceforth. The word hitherto relates to the past. The word henceforth relates to the future. One indicates that we are looking back, and the other indicates that we're looking forward. They are capulated in the words of the hymn that we often sing. We'll praise Him for all that has passed hitherto, and we'll trust Him for all that is uh, to come, henceforth. I want to focus in this morning on an amazing text of Scripture located in verse 11 of Joshua chapter 23 that we've just read. It reads as follows, Take good heed therefore unto yourselves that you love the Lord your God. Take good heed unto yourselves that you love the Lord your God. It's an amazing text. Why should God the Lord speak to His covenant people through His servant Joshua in this way? A people whom God had blessed for many years. Could it be that there were trends beginning to manifest themselves among the people? Trends that were not God-honoring. Could it be that the alarm bells were beginning to ring? that red lights were beginning to flash on the high road to glory. You see, the next book after the book of Joshua is the book of Judges. And the book of Judges contains repeatedly sad, depressing cycles. The people sin. God sent them a judge. The people repented of their sin. They were restored. And then they sinned again and God sent them another judge, and so on and so forth. And the condition within the, the days of the judges could be summed up in one text that is found in that book. And it reads as follows, that there was no king in Israel. And everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. There was no authority in the land. There was no accountability on the part of the people. And when there's no authority in the land, and when there's no accountability on the part of the people, that is a recipe for disaster. And the book of Judges spells out 
in detail the consequences of such a disaster. You see, it only takes a generation for light to be replaced with darkness. It only takes a generation for freedom to be replaced by bondage. It only takes a generation for hope to give way to despair. And so we need to understand what the bottom line is when it comes to our Christian faith. When the Christian faith is reduced to its irreducible minimum, surely it is this, that Christianity, according to the revealed Word of God, is more than believing. It's more than knowing. It's more than doing. Christianity is loving. It is to love the Lord our God. When reduced to its irreducible, the bottom line is this. We are called to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. For as believers in Christ this morning, we have experienced the love of God. Paul writes in his Roman letter, Romans 5, but God shows his love, God displays his love, God manifests his love for us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We have been loved with an everlasting love. But the believer in Christ, not only have they experienced the love of God, the believer in Christ has, be, has been called and commanded to return that love. John says in his letter in 1 John 3 and 18, Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. And we love this morning because he has first loved us. And so Joshua brings this cautioning word. Take good heed. Be very careful. Take careful heed to yourselves that you love the Lord your God. They want us to think about that this morning just for a few moments. Because I believe there are several challenges in this word. And I want to highlight three very quickly, very simply. I believe, first of all, here is a love that challenges us to be different. It's a love that challenges us to be different. Love has been referred to as the badge of Christian discipleship. It has been referred to as the oxygen of the kingdom, the queen of all Christian graces. It's the silver thread that should run through all our conduct. You remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not charity, have not love, I'm just like a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith to us to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And if I give away all that I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Dr. Graham Strogge makes this telling comment in 1 Corinthians 13. He says, it's like waking up to a spring morning full of sunshine and warmth after the coldness and darkness of winter. Paul highlights in 1 Corinthians 13 the prominence that love demands. If I do this, if I say that, if I do the other, but have not love. Agape love. God's love. That love that has been shed or brought in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. I'm nothing. And then he talks about the pattern that love displays. He says, love is patient, love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing. It rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. The Bible says that love keeps no records of wrong. A man was talking to a friend one day, and he says, every time my wife and I have words and fall out, she gets historical. She says, no, 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 no. You mean hysterical? No, no, historical. She says, how's that? She rakes up everything of the past. God doesn't do that. My sin or the bliss of this glorious thought. 
My sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to his cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, O oh, my soul. W.P. Nicholson says that he cast all our sin into the depths of the sea, and he puts up a notice for Satan to read, no fishing here. If the Lord were to mark iniquity this morning, who is there among us that would stand? This is the love that we're thinking about, the prominence that this love demands, the pattern that this love displays, and the permanency that this love defines. Faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And here is a love that will enable us to be kind to one another. Here's a love that will enable us to forgive and forget. Here's a love that will enable us to cherish and to care for each other, and it begins and grows through the love of the Father that is found in the greatest demonstration of love, namely the love of His Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Didn't we sing about it this morning? I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how He could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. In the world, there are lovers of ease. There are lovers of pleasure. There are lovers of money. There are lovers of everything else, but we are called to be lovers of God. Can I ask you a question this morning? And I ask this question to myself repeatedly. How passionate are you are about God? Do you have a passion for God? You know, you can have a passion for doctrine, but not have a passion for God. You can have a passion for accumulating factual information, clean from a constant reading of the Word of God. But if that does not create within you a passion for God, then it's only the means of accumulating knowledge that will enable you to answer a question if it's raised within the context of that knowledge. Joshua says, be very careful. Take heed to love the Lord your God. A.W. Tozer, in one of his helpful books, says, few there are who have a jubilant love for God. Are we passionate about God? Are we passionate about His Son? You see, the world has its passions. And I love J.B. Phillips' translation of Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 when he says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. Here is a love that challenges us to be different. God says to His people through His servant Joshua here, don't be losing your identity. Don't be losing yourself among the nations. Don't lose your identity by marrying those who have no regard for Jehovah but follow after other gods. Don't lose your identity. And we will never lose our identity if we desire and do everything that promotes a love for God. Here is a love that challenges us to be different. Ephesians 4 says, get rid of all bitterness. An awful lot of bitterness among God's people today. Rage and anger, harsh words, slander as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind. Be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. How we need the Lord to pilot us. How we need the Lord to protect us. How do we, how we need the Lord to preserve us from anything that is going to undermine our passion and our love for God. Here's a love that challenges us to be different. Quickly, here's a love that challenges us to be vigilant. To be vigilant. He says, be very careful. He says, take heed. He says, make this a definite priority. We are new creatures, aren't we? in Christ Jesus. If you are a Christian this morning, if you're a child of God through the grace of God, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Christianity is all about new life. Once we were dead in trespasses and in sin. Christianity is all about 
a new light. Once we were in darkness, but now the light of the glorious gospel has shone into our hearts. Once we had no devotion, but we who have new life and we who have new light have a new love. And God wants us to be vigilant. He wants us to make sure that we don't lose our passion and we don't lose our love. And if the fire is not to go out, we need to be vigilant. We leave a glowing fire. We put the guard over the fire. And when we return in the morning or later in the day, the fire's out. And where there once was fire, all the remains are ashes. And the simple implication this morning is this. Has the fire of loving devotion died? Does it need to be revived? Are there ashes where once there was a glow? We need to be vigilant. Uh, we need to watch our love. We need to guard our love. Vance Havner says, the church has no greater need today than to fall in love with Jesus Christ all over again. Are you overwhelmed this morning in the truth that God loves you? Maybe you've had a difficult week. Maybe this is the last place where you really want to be. And maybe you're here this morning, and you would rather be somewhere else, but you know if you're somewhere else, someone will be asking you why you're not here, and you're just here. You're just going through the motions. And the devil has given you a difficult time. And there's a week that lies ahead of you, and, 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 you're, and you're dreading it. How we need to be refreshed this morning in the knowledge that God loves us, and God cares for us, and God understands us. Dr. David Jeremiah writes, this is the most important fact in your life. The eternal, self-existent being who created and sustains everything that exists loves you dearly. This profound thought of God's love should begin and end your every day. It should define your every goal and your every action. Helen Roosevelt was a missionary in Africa whose faith endured despite great suffering. She was attacked. She was robbed. She was raped. And here's how she writes. She says, on that dreadful night, beaten and bruised, terrified and tormented, feeling so much alone, I felt that God had failed me. But there and then, he met me. He met me with the outstretched arms of his love. It was an unbelievable experience. He was so utterly there, so totally understanding. His comfort was so complete. And suddenly I knew, I really knew that his love was absolutely sufficient. The old hymn is true, you know. There is no love like the love of Jesus. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves that you love the Lord your God. It is a challenge here to be different. It is a challenge here to be vigilant. We are to seek first His kingdom. We are to seek first His righteousness. You know, sometimes we can take verses out of context and we make them a pretext. And if we're clever enough, we can maybe give the impression that they're saying what they're not really saying. And often, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20 is used within the context of gospel ministry. And I can understand that. These words, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and sup with him or eat with him and he with me. But in its first context, in its first use, it's a word that is applicable to God's professing people. In this church to whom it was written, Christ is on the outside, he's on the circumference, instead of being central to everything. You see, if we love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, 
then we will be different. And not only will we be different, but we will be vigilant because it's a love that challenges us to be different. It's a love that challenges us to be vigilant. It's a love that challenges us to be obedient, to be obedient. And this is where the rubber hits the road, isn't it? Isn't this what John says in 1 John 2? He ever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. That's strong language. That's the language of the New Testament. Not the language of George McConnell or Clifford Morrison or any preacher. It's the language of the New Testament. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means whoever says that they know and love the Lord, but there's no desire in their heart to honor the Lord in obeying His Word, there is something radically wrong. You see, the truth is not in him, says John. Whoever keeps His Word, whoever obeys His Word, whoever has a desire for His Word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. It's maturing. It's growing. So the evidence of knowing God is obeying God. The evidence of loving the Lord is obeying the Lord. Isn't that what Jesus taught in John 10? Did He not teach that His sheep are marked in the ear and in the foot? He said, My sheep hear My voice, and I know them, and they follow Me, and I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of My hand. My Father who has given them to Me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of My Father's hand. I and the Father are one. It's a great verse, isn't it? Do you believe in the eternal security of the believer? Yes, I do. Do you believe that you're sure of heaven before you die? Yes, I do. Do you believe that God and Christ has made us as secure and safe and strong as Christ Himself? Yes, I do. But I want you to see very carefully in this verse the identity of His sheep. For it's to them He gives eternal life. It's of them, He says, they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of His hand. He says, my sheep are those who hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Where do I hear the voice of God? There's a great deal of nonsense today talked about hearing the voice of God. It's not in some spooky, smoky, flashing light atmosphere. Where do I hear the voice of God? I hear the voice of God through the Word of God. Here is God's voice for me. Here is God speaking to me through His Word. What do I do with His Word? The evidence of saving faith, the evidence of true biblical love is not how much you know, but how well do you obey? You know the story, don't you? In 1 Samuel 15, where God spoke to Samuel to bring the message to Saul, go out and destroy the Amalekites, all of them. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Kill them all. And of course, Saul didn't do that. He kept the best. And Samuel comes over the hill, and Saul greets him. And Saul says to him, Blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment to the Lord. And here is a tremendous word. Samuel says to Saul, Saul, what meaneth the bleating of the sheep? There was the sound of disobedience in the valley. And of course, those words are recorded in 1 Samuel 15. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? It's more blessed to obey. To obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Here's the challenge this morning. It's a challenge to be different. It's a challenge to be vigilant. 
is a challenge to obey. How I need that challenge in my life every day. Augustine says, when you love God, you will do what you like because if we truly love God, we will do what He likes. Kent Hughes writes, nothing is of greater importance than loving God. If we fail to take this seriously, we might find at the end of our lives that all our works counted for nothing, just ashes on the heap. Do you remember what the fathers of the nation of Israel were to teach their children? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. You know something? There are things that can spoil our love. There are things that can steal our love. And there are things that can shape our love and sharpen our love. That's why we need to be vigilant. That's why we need to allow the love of God to be shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. That's how we need to bring our mind and our hearts and our wills under the authority of the Word of God so that this love may be manifest in our difference, that this love may be manifested in our vigilance, that this love may be manifested in our obedience. The late Lewis Scott, to whom I owe an incredible debt, introduced me to many hymns and many hymn writers and the theology of good hymns. And here is a hymn he often would have sung. It was a hymn written by Philip Doddridge. And it reads as follows, My gracious Lord, I own thy right. To every service I can bear, and call it my supreme delight to hear thy precepts and obey. As we enter into another week, may God enable us through our love for him to be different, to be vigilant, to be obedient. Let's pray. Father, we sense the danger of applying your word to others rather than ourselves. Forgive us for that. And help us this morning not just to be hearers of your word, but doers also as we've been teaching the boys and girls. Forgive us if our love for you has not manifested itself in being different from the world, in being vigilant in the world, and being obedient to the Lord himself. We thank you for your word. We remember what Jesus said to the church at Ephesus. I have this against you that you have left, you have abandoned your first love, the love you had at first. Give us ears to hear. Give us hearts and spirits that will respond to your word today. We pray this in Jesus' name, for Christ's sake.